Muy buenas tardes. Eh, mi nombre es Alexander Galetovich. Es un honor tener hoy día con nosotros a Sabrina Kahn, profesora de Economía en Bowdoin College y, y una connotada historiadora económica que se ha especializado en propiedad intelectual, emprendimiento e innovación. Su investigación arroja luz sobre las fuentes del crecimiento económico de largo plazo, incluido el progreso tecnológico en Europa y los Estados Unidos. Es una investigadora pionera en la historia económica de las patentes y los derechos de autor. Su primer libro, La democratización de la invención, las patentes y el copyright durante el desarrollo de la economía americana entre 1790 y 1920, publicado por eh, Cambridge University Press, recibió el premio Alice Hanson Jones de Historia Económica de América del Norte. Actualmente está completando un estudio sobre el espíritu empresarial, las inversiones y la creatividad tecnológica de las mujeres, que tendrá eh, título Mujeres en la República de la Empresa. Su trabajo ha recibido numerosos honores, incluyendo una beca Fulbright, el Hoover National Fellowship y la beca Grilliches, que el NBR, National Bureau of Economic Research, otorga una vez cada dos años a un economista empírico. Hoy tendremos una conversación con la profesora Kahn sobre su libro más reciente, Inventando Ideas, Patentes, Premios y la Economía del Conocimiento, publicado por Oxford University Press. Este libro examina por qué Estados Unidos pudo arrebatarle a Inglaterra y Francia la frontera tecnológica para convertirse en el líder industrial mundial y el rol que jugaron la propiedad intelectual y las patentes. La conversación será en inglés, pero pueden seguir la traducción simultánea si así lo prefieren. El chat va a estar abierto para preguntas y comentarios y va a introducir esta conversación el rector de la universidad, Harald Beyer. Buenas tardes, bienvenidas y bienvenidos. Eh, muchas gracias, eh, profesora Khan, por acompañarnos. Hay algo importante que se olvidó Alex en su presentación. Ella viene, hizo sus estudios de doctorado en una gran universidad, eh, que es la misma en la que yo hice mis estudios de posgrado. Eh, no, pero bromas aparte, eh, voy a partir citando unos párrafos del libro de la profesora Khan, del último libro, el que, el que citó, el que mencionó justamente Alex Galetovich, y que corresponden a algunas ideas que están expresadas en el capítulo 13 de su libro. Pues, abro comillas. En los últimos años ha habido un resurgimiento de afirmaciones de que la participación directa del gobierno en la innovación tecnológica ha llevado a e incluso es necesaria para el progreso técnico y económico. Según estos autores, sigo citando a la profesora Kahn, la evidencia histórica demuestra que la efectividad de estas intervenciones por parte de un Estado empresario, entre comillas, eh, 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 perdón, demuestra la efectividad de estas intervenciones por parte de un Estado empresario. Ha Jung Chang, por ejemplo, apela a una selección de la literatura secundaria para apoyar la afirmación de que instituciones como la propiedad privada y los mercados libres eran menos importantes para dicho progreso que las iniciativas estatales en financiamiento, inversión directa y regulación. Múltiples empresas habrían dependido a lo largo de la historia de la previsión y el liderazgo del Estado dominante para tener el riesgo, actuar como pioneras en la provisión de financiación e investigación y otras formas de apoyo, e identificar los caminos que el sector privado debe seguir. Sigo eh, citando a la profesora Khan. Numerosos trabajos sobre el cambio tecnológico proponen de manera similar las ventajas de los sistemas nacionales de innovación. Al igual que los partidarios del Estado empresario, los defensores de estos sistemas destacan los beneficios de las políticas gubernamentales ilustradas que sustituyen al mercado en forma de participación estatista indirecta y directa en el espíritu empresarial y la innovación. Estos autores están convencidos de que la historia revela el vasto potencial de innovación que se puede desatar con políticas gubernamentales adecuadas. Identifican estructuras explícitas y vínculos internacionales de organizaciones y agencias del gobierno federal, corporaciones, universidades e investigación financiada por el Estado. La, la suposición general es que los mercados fracasan en el ámbito del conocimiento y la tecnología 
con lo que el progreso técnico y el éxito en la comercialización se pueden lograr mejor a través de la ingeniería social por un gobierno coordinado visionario. Hasta aquí la cita del de texto de la profesora Carr. Ella se propone comprobar si esto efectivamente es así, si estos párrafos de alguna forma se pueden testear empíricamente y chequear si hasta qué grado el, eh, 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 es efectiva estas afirmaciones. Lo interesante para el debate chileno es que estas mismas ideas están circulando en Chile. Y se está argumentando que a propósito de la baja productividad de nuestra economía, nosotros tenemos que pensar, por ejemplo, en sistemas nacional de innovación. Ella es una historiadora económica, es una experta además en propiedad intelectual y está extraordinariamente capacitada a propósito de su trayectoria para contestar esta pregunta. ¿Tienen sustento entonces? Lo interesante es cómo ella aborda estos problemas en su libro, porque la profesora Khan no solamente la somete a su escrutinio, a un escrutinio cuidadoso, sino que lo hace recurriendo a la historia y también, por cierto, a la evidencia empírica. La clave en su trabajo está en entender, o, 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 o la clave de su trabajo es entender que empíricamente es imposible verificar el impacto de instituciones centralizadas. Todas estas afirmaciones son empíricamente imposibles de verificar. Y por lo tanto lo que ella hace es a través de un análisis sistemático de instituciones administradas descentralizadamente comprobar por la vía de contrastes si esta tesis tiene asidero. Parece un esfuerzo y la lectura del libro así lo indica bastante titánico. Sin embargo, ella sale airosa de esto. Sus estudios reflejados en este libro tienen, me parece, una enorme importancia para iluminar el debate que al respecto está ocurriendo en Chile. A propósito, entonces, de esa investigación es que Alexander Galeitovich, la Escuela de Gobierno y la Universidad de Olfibáñez quisieron invitar a la profesora Khan para que de alguna forma nos muestre y nos ilustre sobre esta larga investigación. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos, profesora Khan. Y claro, una pregunta entonces que sale de esta investigación es si será conveniente, por ejemplo, avanzar a su Sistema Nacional de Innovaciones en Chile. La palabra es suya, profesora. Muchas gracias, Harald. Vamos ahora con la charla de la profesora Khan. Les recuerdo que el chat está abierto para preguntas y comentarios y que pueden seguir la charla en traducción simultánea, si así lo desean. Los dejo con Sorina Khan. I'm just testing to make sure that you can hear me and that and you can see the, the slide. Yes. Fantastic. Buenas noches a todos. Muchísimas gracias al presidente Bayer y al profesor Alexander Galetovich por invitarme a presentar en este seminario. Me siento honrada de tener la oportunidad de hablar con ustedes. Yo sé leer fácilmente el español, pero como pueden escuchar sin duda, tengo dificultad en hablarlo. Así que, por favor, perdónenme por presentar en inglés. Tonight, I'm going to discuss the relationship between ideas, innovation institutions, and economic growth. Now, it might seem impossible to cover 300 years of world economic history in 30 minutes or so, but we economic historians are not deterred by the merely impossible. I once asked a colleague what job she would choose if she weren't an economic historian. And she said that she'd be a detective like Sherlock Holmes. And it's true that economic historians are a lot like detectives, looking for clues to the mystery of what determines the wealth and poverty of nations. The US has been the most successful economy in all of human history and has been the world leader for over 150 years. 
In the 18th century, few would have predicted this outcome. Colonies in Latin America and the Caribbean, like Barbados, Argentina, Haiti, and Cuba, were initially much more successful than North America. Voltaire, for example, considered French and English battles over North America during the Seven Years' War to be idiotic because, and I quote, he said, it was fighting over a few acres of snow. Here in Maine, it's fighting over a lot of acres of snow. So if you consider the GDP per capita, say in Barbados in 1700, it was 150% of US GDP per capita. And even in 1800, Argentina had higher per capita than the US. Of course, the data aren't here for Haiti, but Haiti was actually one of the richest countries in the Caribbean. Even in 1820, the US was just regarded as a banana republic without any bananas. Most people were quite certain that the US would never progress beyond copying European culture and technology. As one British writer noted, in the four quarters of the globe, who reads an American book or goes to an American play or looks at an American picture or a statue? And that was also true of technology. Historians frequently ask the question, why was Britain the first industrial nation? My research shifts the focus to a question I think is more relevant for developing countries today. Why did the US overtake Europe to become the global economic leader? There's no debate that technological innovation plays a central role in answering that question. Paul Romer won the Nobel Prize for his theories about innovation and economic growth. He noted, and I quote, the key step in understanding economic growth is to think carefully about ideas. This is not a new insight. All societies since Greek, since Greek antiquity have recognized the importance of knowledge and ideas. However, there are marked differences in their conceptions of the types of knowledge that would be valuable, who was most likely to generate useful knowledge, and which incentives would work best. So as President Bayer pointed out, I've investigated these questions using extensive empirical analysis because endogenous growth models lack strong empirical support. So my project attempts to address that deficiency by extensive research over a decade actually of archival research in Britain, France, and the US. I call this an artisanal sample because I collected the data myself in places no other economists have visited. I've tracked down data in basements in London, attics and concrete bunkers outside of Paris, and even exotic locations like Boston and San Francisco. My data set of over 160,000 observations across three countries includes information on inventors and inventions, patterns of patenting and different types of innovation prizes, as well as information on more aggregated policies by governments. This comprehensive data set allows me to draw general conclusions about how innovation institutions and incentives actually worked. Now, although there is a lot of detective work involved, this isn't a murder mystery, so I'm now going to reveal my findings. Europe favored top-down innovation systems, and this is also true of Latin America, in which elites and state administrators made key economic decisions about prizes, rewards, and the allocation of resources. These policies proved to be inefficient and harmful to social progress over the long run. By contrast, the US supported decentralized markets for ideas, flexible, accountable, open access institutions. The analysis indicates that sustained economic growth depends on the degree to which institutions enable ordinary individuals to benefit from their innovation, creativity, and resulting changes in the marketplace. 
And here is an example of some of the archival data that I acquired. In some of them, the, the handwriting is incredibly bad. So I'm not sure whether I'm not understanding the French or the Spanish or whether it's because the, the person uh, is uh, proposing an impossible invention. Now, the title of my book, Inventing Ideas, is actually a pun. Un juego de palabras, because I also show how a lot of what we think we know about technological innovation is invented or just plain incorrect. Tonight, I'm going to mention five of these myths about inventions. There are actually many more myths than five, but to find out what they are, you'll have to read the book. So the first myth is that patents are harmful monopolies and weak patent rights benefit society more. Second, innovation prizes are competitive and more beneficial to social welfare. The third is about human capital and knowledge. The assumption is that growth depends on investments in elite scientists, engineers, university level education, and knowledge in what's called the upper tails of the distribution. Fourth, technological change is created by great inventors, special individuals, and large scale macro inventions, rather than small incremental inventions. Fifth, growth requires top down initiatives and national innovation systems. Now, To better understand innovation institutions, we can consider a spectrum. So you have at one end markets for ideas, and at the other end, you have what I call administered innovation systems at the other. And I'll refer to this for short as AIS. Now, administered innovation systems refer to arrangements where economic decisions about values, rewards, and the allocation of resources are made by the state, by panels, or administrators. Now, you often have criticisms being made about patents that there are monopolies and that, say, alternatives like prizes would be better because they're competitive. But actually, all administered systems are essentially monop sunnies. Now, you might not have taken a class in economics, but a monopoly is a single seller, whereas a monop sunny involves a single buyer. And what this means is that, say, the state is offering awards, then the state is the only entity that's making these decisions. They're on one side of the market, and all of the sellers are on the other side. So the state has a monopsony position. And what I want to show is that that monopsony is far more e inefficient than any potential for patent monopolies. President Bayer, in his own research, has pointed out that good governance requires, and I quote, an institutional framework that generates accountability. But participants in administered systems rarely bear the costs of their incorrect decisions. Europeans and Latin Americans favored a top-down technocratic approach featuring a central role for the state, for elites and investments in costly, scarce inputs, science and large-scale engineering projects. Elites have always mistrusted markets. Wealth and influence, like Elon Musk, for instance, often lead to the conviction that the insights of the favored few can outperform decentralized coordination among the untutored masses. Britain and France offered a vast array of administered payouts for technologies, including prizes, medals and honors, grants, subsidies, pensions. How well did these administered systems work in promoting useful ideas? Spoiler alert, the answer is, very badly. Central planners lack the incentives and information that are necessary to find correct prices and to allocate resources to the most highly valued use. My research shows that when decisions are made by monopsonies, whether it's a state or some committee, rather than by open markets, it creates the danger of corruption or cognitive dissonance, unjust discrimination, and essentially idiosyncratic outcomes. Elite administrators gave out awards to groups very much like themselves. Outcomes were determined by the identity of the judges and the identity of the inventors, rather than the value of the invention. 
administered systems incentivized rent seeking and the pursuit of multiple awards rather than efforts to commercialize ideas to meet market demand. Now, Joseph Stieglitz won the Nobel Prize in economics. So it's not surprising that he thinks prizes are a good thing. He claims that administered awards are more efficient and equitable than patents. Now, I actually know a great deal more about the Royal Society of Arts than Joseph Stieglitz does. I spent several months in the RSA and I use RSA as shorthand for the Royal Society of Arts. I spent several months in the RSA archives in London, going through all of their account books. The RSA prohibited prize winners from applying for patents. So it offers a valuable opportunity to see the independent effect of prizes. We observe an adverse selection effect owing to the need to choose between prizes and patents. Inventors with commercially useful ideas obtained rewards in the market. The ones with rubbish inventions applied for RSA prizes. The committees at the Royal Society of Arts were unable to identify useful ideas and found it impossible to assign accurate values. The society itself, after 100 years, finally acknowledged their failure, admitting that their efforts had been, and I quote, futile and had contributed nothing to the Industrial Revolution. They then switched to supporting the patent system. Even in the US, administrative innovation systems suffered from similar drawbacks. For instance, at the Franklin Institute, this is an institution that still exists today in Philadelphia. At the Franklin Institute, innovation prizes were supposed to be open to anybody in the country. However, women, members of the working class, and other disadvantaged groups were significantly less likely to receive awards. Throughout the entire 19th century, five women got awards from the Franklin Institute. Meanwhile, in terms of patents, there were thousands of women who were able to get awards through the patent system. The likelihood of getting a prize was much higher for associates of the Franklin Institute itself. And I refer to this as social capture, where an institution is, is uh, going to turn into something that provides benefits for its own members rather than for the rest of society. Now, as President Bayer pointed out, today many claim, many people claim that an entrepreneurial state is necessary to, to generate technological change and economic growth. However, what I find is that administered systems are ineffective at a private level, and they're even less effective at the national level. As the economists noted, often would be entrepreneurial states end up pouring money down rat holes. The world is littered with imitation Silicon Valleys that produce nothing but debt. The analysis further supports conclusions by Alexander Galetovich who points out that public-private partnerships are often touted as the best, best of both worlds alternative to public provision. But in practice, they've been docked by all sorts of problems, including waste and unrealistic expectations. Now, Alexander has provided models to show how we can remedy those deficiencies, but I wonder at the probability that the government will implement his suggestions. <laughs> Now, most national innovation systems highlight linkages between the state, between industry, and between universities. But in practice, they, the, the proponents of these models and policymakers tend to ignore or underestimate the pivotal role of markets in meeting the wants of consumers and end users. So by contrast to Europe and Latin America, the US placed markets and ideas at the forefront of its policies. And I find it quite amusing that the Statue of Liberty itself is covered by a patent. 
the US Constitution. includes this clause, which is the intellectual property clause. And I feel that the modern knowledge economy had its start when, for the first time in world history, intellect, this intellectual property clause was included in the US Constitution. And this actually was the only clause in the entire Constitution passed unanimously and without debate. Everything else was very contentious to the extent that people even despaired of the constitution ever being created. But this was the only clause that was passed unanimously and without debate. The design of the US patent system was unique in the world in offering accessible property rights and incentives for inventive activity, rather than to raise money for the government or to grant monopolies to a favored few. The legal and judicial system declared that a patent is property of the highest order. And that's a quote, a patent is a property of the highest order. Once granted, the patent right was absolute and there were no restrictions such as compulsory licensing or working requirements. As a result, the US offered the strongest patent protection in the world and this security promoted markets and ideas. Extensive markets and ideas enable the efficient allocation of resources in a manner that no administered system could possibly replicate. Any inventor with a good idea, regardless of their background, could raise funding for projects on the strength of the patent right. The ability to sell or license patents in the marketplace was especially important for disadvantaged inventors without capital or connections. US policies were based on the premise that good ideas could come from anyone in the population, and it was up to the market to determine what was useful or valuable. Accessible property rights offered incentives to all creative members of society, including immigrants, women, black inventors, and even economists. For instance, the very first patent statute of 1790 stipulated that he, she, or they would be able to secure property rights in their inventions. Now, remember that this was a time when women couldn't vote and married women had no property rights of their own, but at the federal level, they were guaranteed property rights in their inventions. And uh, I've studied a lot of women's inventions, and this one here is one of my favorites by um, Sarah Sewell. I think she's from Ohio. And this is a combined washing machine and seesaw. You know, seesaw is this uh, this game that that uh, children play where the board goes up they sit on either end and it goes up and down and she used this seesaw to link it to a washing machine so when they played on the seesaw it would automatically wash the clothes now this is a sort of invention that no administered administration would ever uh, decide was important enough to grant property rights but uh, actually i saw something very similar in africa now, especially today, it's often assumed that ordinary people have little to contribute to technological discovery, which should be left to qualified individuals like engineers, architects, or physicists. However, it's important to note that this claim confuses technical value with economic value. If you ask some government bureaucrat what is a great invention, they'll probably say a rocket launcher or a nuclear reactor. From my point of view, one of the greatest inventions is maybe the paperclip or the electric kettle. Because as Thomas Jefferson pointed out, and I quote, a smaller invention applicable to our daily concerns is infinitely more valuable than the greatest, which can only be used for great objects. So a spaceship to Mars benefits a few super wealthy individuals like Elon Musk, whereas a kettle benefits everybody, especially those of us who love tea. Now, patents benefit society as well as inventors because information about the discovery is available to everyone. You might suppose that prizes, which do not have a right of exclusion, would generate greater knowledge spillovers than patents. Instead, I find the opposite. That is, that patents produce significant spillovers, but prizes do not. Now, you might find this surprising, but actually, if we think about it, 
US patent rules were designed to maximize disclosure and to ensure open access to information. However, in almost all administered innovation systems, there are no specific mechanisms to ensure that information is disseminated or that the idea is commercialized or that consumers will finally benefit. So it's not surprising that the institutions that were introduced in the United States proved to be very influential to follower countries like Japan. Now, this is a quote from a prime minister of Japan who made a visit to the US to investigate. As he said, we've looked about us to see what nations are the greatest so that we could be like them. We asked, what is it that makes the US such a great nation? We investigated and we found it was patents and we will have patents. So he went back to Japan and recommended that it was important to have a strong patent system. And he became the first commissioner of patents for Japan. Adjacent institutions such as a flexible legal system, suffrage, and schooling also played an important role in US success. American schooling differed from the elitist educational systems in other countries. By 1850, almost every state in the West and North had laws to encourage free schools that were open to all children, and basic schooling and literacy rates were the highest in the world. By contrast, in Europe and much of Latin America, schooling rates remained low even at the end of the 19th century. Today, the World Bank notes that attention in Chile, and I quote, has been overly focused on innovation in universities rather than on the broader process of fostering individual enterprise and domestic innovative capabilities. Many of the founders of the world's most valuable companies have never attended college or dropped out before graduation. These include Michael Dell, Larry Ellison, Bill Gates, Zuckerberg, the legendary Chinese entrepreneur Jack Ma had not written a single line of code before founding Alibaba. Bureaucrats are quite unlikely to be able to identify such seemingly unqualified people who can disrupt entire industries. In the early industrial era, the majority of great inventors in the United States and women in particular benefit from learning through apprenticeships rather than advanced education. Currently, the US Department of Labor is promoting apprenticeships as a way to help reduce income inequality and promote social justice. Mark Benioff, the billionaire founder of Salesforce, argues that companies are some of the best universities in the world. Switzerland today, of course, is a leader in the knowledge economy, but many don't realize that it's largely because of an apprenticeship model. Only 25% of high school students go on to study at universities. Instead, almost 70% of Swiss high school graduates enter into apprenticeships. China's modern economy is another useful case study. China's top-down innovation strategy mimics the 19th century European belief in administered systems, upper tail knowledge, and the importance of elites. Just as in England in the 18th century, copyright in China today is linked to state efforts to control free expression. Chinese bureaucrats are busy directing immense resources to boost its stock of science and technology inputs. You look at any graduate econ program or engineering program in the US and the majority of students are from China. The Chinese example reveals how a top-down innovation system can easily incentivize corruption rather than higher productivity. For example, firms with inflated patent portfolios in China can gain government credit, subsidies, and profitable state contracts. 
This has led to a heavy emphasis on filing a larger quantity of patents, but without much attention to the quality. Similarly, scientific researchers engage in questionable practices, such as manipulating the number of citations to their papers. Such administered innovation created widespread distortions and has misallocated research talent. I was looking at a paper of surveys of Chinese scientists working in the US today, and they found that the this, this state of administered innovation was the major reason for their migration. Now, it's not surprising that despite China's high rate of investments in knowledge generating inputs, total factor productivity and output per capita remains significantly below the US. Especially in a country of over 1 billion people, economic progress necessarily depends on the contributions and involvement of ordinary citizens. China has experienced the benefits of removing constraints on its markets, but until it realizes that decentralization is a prerequisite for inclusive, self-sustaining growth, it will likely fail in its quest to overtake the US. Now, innovation policies in Chile were similar to those in Europe. The patent system in the 19th century was closer to the administered end of the spectrum than to the market and ideas. For instance, early patents were granted by ad hoc commissions. So if you wanted a patent, then they would put together a commission just for that purpose, who would secretly evaluate the applications. The final decision about granting the patent was based on the committee's assessment of how useful the idea was likely to be. Now, inventors could also influence the likelihood of getting a patent with sad accounts of how difficult it had been for them to make the invention. There were working requirements which favored wealthy owners or of factories or those with privileged connections. It's odd, but once granted, the patent was actually kept secret until it expired, which obviously limited spillovers of information. Chilean historians have concluded that these early laws favored political and economic elites, but disadvantaged local craftsmen with small inventions trying to satisfy domestic demand. And here are two examples of Chilean patents. The first is, it looks very technical, right? You might think that it, it's some sort of sewing machine, but actually, it's to cut cigars. And uh, this other one here is from Luis Lopez of Valparaiso, and it's to mix cocktails and alcoholic drinks. Oops. Now, the Global Competitiveness Report for 2021 concluded that, and I quote, low rates of patenting and domestic technological capabilities limit Chile's growth prospects. Moreover, markets for ideas can continue to be deficient or non-existent, end quote. Chile has further been calling for weaker patents and compulsory licensing to meet public health needs. It's not surprising that the US has long had Chile on a watch list because it has, and I quote, serious concerns about its approach to intellectual property. Now, the Chilean government has acknowledged that innovation is key to progress, correctly emphasizing the challenges and opportunities of green technologies. However, being me, I found it rather interesting that the Ministry of Science and Technology is enthusiastic about innovation prizes. And the minister said that we've decided to try challenge prize competitions as a method to stimulate innovation in Chile to improve the quality of life of its inhabitants. However, when I tried to find out more about these prizes, I just encountered a page of error messages. <laughs> the administered system hard at work.
So let me conclude. The economic history of Europe, China, and Latin America provides a cautionary tale for those who support administered systems and ambitious state-led policies to dictate the course of innovation and growth. Europe and Latin America were characterized by highly unbalanced access to private property rights and political and economic structures that were biased in favor of elites. Their administered innovation systems similarly limited economic opportunities for the masses and served to perpetuate inequality over the long run. Although top-down systems have at times led to temporary spurts, they have consistently failed to induce self-sustained long-term economic progress. One of the most striking innovations in the US was that its institutions were designed to ensure that rewards accrued to the deserving based on productivity rather than on the arbitrary basis of class, patronage, or privilege. Decentralized decision-making fostered a diversity of inventors whose disruptive inventions and innovation at the edge benefited the entire nation and even the global economy. The US model demonstrates that the most effective incentive for improvement is failure in the market. The best prize to promote innovation and growth is success in the market. Gracias por su atención. Espero con interés el debate con ustedes. So thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Uh, I, I recall everybody that the chat is open, so to, for your questions. Let me start by, um, by asking you a historical question. You put into a question, the, uh, the book says that the big uh, push to uh, growth and industrialization came in the, from the US, not really from the uh, early industrial revolution in Britain or in uh, France. Um, would you say that world economic growth would have stalled without the US? And, and second, uh, let, let, me, uh, let me pose a hypothetical, uh, hypothetical question. Uh, what if the US wouldn't have had any patent system in place? Do you think, how, how would have that changed the uh, trajectory of the industrial revolution? Those are two central questions and very complex questions to answer. The first is a grand counterfactual, which is let's imagine a world without the US patent system. Now, Britain and France did generate industrialization, but it was a pattern that was very unbalanced. So the productivity was largely concentrated on a few key sectors, such as textiles and iron and steel, et cetera. Industries that were very capital intensive and industries where you could, you could afford to, to get a patent because a patent was very expensive in, in both Britain and, and France. So because of the cost of getting the patent, which was like four or five times per capita income, it meant that only inventions that were sufficiently large uh, and capital intensive would survive that filter. And it was intended to be that way. So what you found was that the benefits were focused in a few key sectors, and those sectors ran into diminishing returns. Whereas in the US, because you had very accessible property rights, there were no filters on the types of inventions that could succeed. And as a result, you had this tsunami of discoveries from you know, better tea kettles to lar large uh, 
large uh, agriculture machines. And the growth was, was very balanced. It was distributed across the entire economy. Because you had this sort of cumulative effect of these small, supposedly small inventions, it led to increasing returns rather than diminishing returns. So I would say the answer to that is that without the US, you would have had uh, a very a very rapid diminution in world economic growth. Because of course, the benefits in the US spilled over not just to citizens of the US, but to the entire world. As for the patent system, you know, this, this is a vexed question that many people have posed that do you need a patent system? And in the absence of a patent system, there would be alternatives to generate innovation and growth. However, I think that the consequences would be far less important for economic growth than under a patent system where you ha have the ability not just to get exclusive rights in your in your invention, but also to have a market in ideas. And that market in ideas leads to spillovers for everyone. Do you have any follow-up questions for, for, for that point? Uh, no, but okay. let me let me follow uh, on that. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned you mentioned that the patent system enables uh, 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 let me let me let me go back to one of your uh, myths. Um, economists view patents as uh, granting a monopoly, and they uh, and they they we say that there is a trade-off between uh, static inefficiency uh, in order to give incentives to innovate. One of the one of the uh, one of the main points of your book is that patents do not grant any monopolies. So two questions: Why is it that uh, the monopoly view is so prevalent, and then why is it that uh, that uh, patents don't grant um, monopolies uh, uh, regular? I mean, in, in in general. I think that the monopoly view is so prevalent because of us economists that we are enamored of our own models, and we rarely think about how they actually apply to real world situations. So of course, the monopoly model is one which says, imagine there is perfect competition, which means that the idea has already been invented to be able to everyone. And now you have a patent and it turns into a monopoly. So basically the monopolist is able to restrict output and drive up prices, and that's bad for everyone. But actually the US system, the US legal system and the US intellectual property system overturned that idea. Judges in the US refused to admit that patents were monopolies. And the reason was that, again, the question is, what is the relevant counterfactual? Are you thinking about a world in which the idea has already been invented? And then the patentee is taking that idea and making it his own private property and turning it into a monopoly. Or as in the case of the US system, a patent was only granted if the idea was novel, which, which means that the person had to come up with the idea themselves. It had to be new, not just in the US, but in the entire world. So this means that the counterfactual is not a world in which the invention already exists. The counterfactual is a world in which you grant the patent. It creates an incentive for somebody to turn their creativity towards trying to come up with a better kettle. And once they've done that, then they're giving something to the rest of the world. They're not taking away something from the world. So it's not a monopoly. They're actually giving to the world something that can now, after the patent is expired, be available to everyone else. For this reason, you know, it, it's, it's based on this idea of novelty, that you're creating something that's new that never existed. That's not a monopoly. It, it is, in fact, often leading to myriads of variants of that, that invention because it incentivizes other people to try to make differentiated versions of that, that product. And as you yourself have pointed out, 
it tends to lead to falls in prices rather than an increase in prices over time and an increase in output through the you know, you look at the world around us today, and if you think about the enormous number of things that are patented that have never existed before, clearly it's not taking away, it's adding to world welfare. So one, um, one view of, of prices uh, is, is uh, or why prices are better is that uh, it is claimed that patents lead to a lot of litigation. Now, if I understood your book correctly, uh, you, you don't have such a negative view of, litiga of patent litigation. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Again, we have to think about why there is litigation. And litigation occurs because the idea is of value. Whenever you have things that are valuable, you're going to have disputes. Now, if we think about ex ante when patents are granted, suppose, let's, let's just theorize that suppose it's feasible for the patent office to perfectly delineate the property right for every single one of the 10 million patents that have been granted in the US, then that would foreclose on litigation because the, you'd have perfect property rights. But that would be enormously expensive and costly because the vast majority of patents are absolutely worthless. So we'd be wasting social resources in determining property rights ex ante when the patent is being granted. With litigation, it's an exposed determination of value and property rights because once the invention has been revealed to be valuable, then the courts come in and determine the the scope of the property rights. So I actually think that litigation is a more cost-effective way of determining the boundaries of property rights than having the patent office do this. The second point is that when you have valuable ideas, you don't just have litigation surrounding patents, you have litigation throughout the entire legal system. If you look at all of the great inventions, you know, I, I have read thousands of lawsuits about these sorts of uh, litigation. And what I show is that for all important inventions, whether it, it's something dealing with the automobile or whether it's dealing with, uh, with uh, electricity, with all important inventions, initially you get an upsurge of litigation, not just about patents, but everything, contracts, property, torts, crime, everything, because necessarily they are important to people around us and that generates litigation. But after a certain point, you get an adjustment, an institutional adjustment and the litigation falls as these disputes are resolved and become incorporated in the existing rules and standards. So would, so would uh, bursts of litigation signal that there is a lot of inventive activity going on? It could, but you can deflate the litigation by the inventive activity and have litigation per invention, uh -huh. and the, the patterns still hold. I, so I, I think what it's signaling is that you have value being created, and whenever you have value being created and, and enormous changes occurring in society, then there is a need for adjustments in institutions to incorporate those changes. You know, for instance, before the airplane was invented, nobody cared about property rights in the air, right? You, you didn't care whether you had property rights two miles up in the air because it, it simply wasn't relevant. But once the airplane was invented, then property rights actually adjusted and limited the, the property rights you had in, in airspace above your land, because then air becomes an important part of the entire ecosystem for airplanes. Let me let me go back a bit to the monopoly question. In in your research, you have looked at uh, at hundreds of thousands of patents. How often is it the case that an innovation doesn't have any substitutes, or that is is it common that an innovation uh, or patented innovation creates a burst of other innovations that are substitutes? Uh, what what I'm trying to give some content to the idea that a patent doesn't grant a monopoly. Some patents 
are simply irrelevant. Nobody cares about them. Some patents are important, but the importance varies according to whether, as you point out, there are substitutes that are available. However, if there are no substitutes, then that's enormously profitable. And we would expect that it would create an incentive for individuals to try to come up with non-infringing substitutes that would allow them to get a piece of the pie. I mean, you look at you look at the ball pen, you know, the ballpoint pen, or even uh, I, I mentioned that I think the paperclip is an important invention. Actually, there are about 500 patents on paperclips, so all sorts of paperclips. Now, there was some initial paperclip that was very quote unquote important, but then people saw that that was something that was going to be of value in the marketplace and it created an incentive for them to kind of come up with their own versions. So I think that if there are enormous profits to be made on an important invention, it's going to be the very short term because essentially markets and ideas are competitive and it will create incentives for people to try to increase the number of substitutes that are available. Yeah, one of the one of the fascinating aspects of your book is is uh, documentation of the market for ideas. Uh, can you elaborate a, a bit more about uh, the the market of ideas and how does it uh, how how is it a complement of the market for stuff and what what are the consequences of having a thriving market for ideas? Well, we can start by looking at prizes. Because with prizes, you get you get a payment upfront. You get a payment right at the beginning, and at that point, there is no incentive for the person who gets the reward to continue further. They've already got the reward. They don't have any incentive to try to turn the good into something that's going to be valuable to consumers. I was at a I was at a meeting where they were they were featuring people who had gotten these grand innovation prizes. And one of them was a guy who I talked to afterwards and he'd gotten a prize for coming up with a way to make water out of air. Now you can see that this is an enormously important idea. So I, I asked him, well, what's your next step? He said he's going to try to get more awards for this idea. I said, why don't you try to market it? And he said, well, I can't really do that because it's not scalable. You know, I can make a tiny amount of water, but I can't make enough that it would fill a bucket or it'd be valuable to an entire society. And I think that with prizes, you sort of short, short circuit this market for idea for ideas because people don't have any incentive to try to make something useful out of this. In the case of patents, what a patent does is it takes this idea and it turns it like, like a security. It, it turns it into something that can be traded like a stock in a firm. And once you can trade on that idea, then if you yourself can't commercialize the idea, and many many inventors, you know, they would specialize in invention, and they don't have the capability to be entrepreneurial and to turn the idea into something that's workable, so they sell it to someone who can, and that intermediary maybe himself is not going to be an entrepreneur, but he can then find someone else who is able to turn to commercializable product that's going to be benefit individuals. So the point about a market in ideas is that it enables all of the benefits that markets offer us, the benefits of capturing information and prices so that you know what the value is, the benefits of intermediation, the benefits of specialization, the division of labor, all of the things that Adam Smith pointed to as benefits of markets are, are now available for ideas. And that nexus between the inventor, the market, and the end user turns that initial 
initial invention into something that is scalable and that can benefit end users and consumers in the marketplace. And the key thing is that the person who decides that the idea is important is not some lordly individual sitting in a committee, it's the consumer themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you, I mean, uh, are these markets for ideas, how fast did they, did um, an international markets, market for ideas uh, emerge? And did it emerge in the period that you studied uh, in, in this uh, tr transition when the US overtook the world? Yes, I, I, I have um, one, one chapter in my book, it's called Selling Ideas. And it shows that quite early on, the US developed deliberately a market invention. First, it was intended by the policymakers who formulated patent rules that there should be a market. So in the US, right from the beginning, you, you were required to register any sale of the patent. And this was called an assignment. So it was registered and put down so that people could trace what was happening to the invention. And you had these rights were subdivided minutely by district, by, uh, by companies, by areas, by, by, by states. So huge networks of inventive trades would occur surrounding a particular invention. And quite early on, Americans, were able to engage in international international markets. So for instance, some of the first multinationals were patentees, such as Isaac Singer, you know, who made the Singer sewing machine. And they went overseas. And of course, if they went overseas, they would have to get right in that country. But because they found that many countries for instance, in, in, um, in England, they didn't enforce patent rights and there were no examinations to find out whether the person actually invented the, the, the innovation. So many Americans found that the Europeans were actually taking the American ideas and using it as their own. An example is, in England, the raincoat is called a Macintosh. You know, it was made of rubber and it's called a Macintosh after Charles Macintosh. However, Charles Macintosh actually stole the ideas of Charles Goodyear, who it was the first inventor of a usable rubber in the US. So the Macintosh in England was stolen from Charles Goodyear and should actually be called the Goodyear. But because of the insecurity of property rights overseas, many of these American inventors had to set up their own, their own factories because then they could use trade secrets to protect their ideas rather than depend on the uncertainty of, of enforcement of their patents overseas. And this is one of the reasons why Americans started lobbying to have stronger patent rights in the rest of the world. It was designed to ensure that American patents would be well served in the international market for ideas. I see. So we're nearing the end of, of, uh, of your talk. Let me, let me ask you one uh, uh, a question about, in which I'm curious about. Um, how is it, I mean, how is it to make research uh, to first build uh, a huge database from archives before you say something? Can you, can you tell us a bit how, how your, um, how your pro that process is and uh, what do you do? I think I've mentioned that uh, the first thing is that I visit all of these archives in very odd locations. For instance, in Paris, I was in one archive outside of, of, of Paris actually. And it was in a very dodgy area with graffiti all over on the walls. And the building was this concrete building surrounded with barbed wire. And uh, in, 
it looked like a, con a construction site and I was going around, there was nobody in sight and I was going around shouting, ya kelka, ya kelka. is there anybody here? Is there anybody here? And then someone peered over and said, oh, hello, we're up here in the attic. And then I went up into the attic and was able to go through all these big dusty stacks of, of uh, material. And in the material that they gave me, you know, there were these letters that had been sent by inventors to the administrator asking for protection and for help and, and prizes. And some of them still had the seal, the wax seal on them. They had never been opened. And I asked whether I could open one of them. And when I opened it, it was so sad, you know, it was from 200 years ago, this guy saying that he was in desperate straits, that he'd sent letter after letter and gotten no response. He was hoping to get some help for his invention. And touching these materials and, and seeing this firsthand really gives you a sense of the frustrations of dealing with administered systems. And ultimately, as an economist, I think the happiest times are, say, at two o'clock in the morning when I'm on my computer and running regressions and the results are coming out exactly as I hoped they would. I think that that's the Zen moment, that there's no happier time in one's life. <laughs> I see. Um, Sorina, we are, uh, time is over. Uh, we are, uh, we thank you for this fascinating talk. Uh, and uh, we are looking forward for um, your book on uh, women entrepreneurs, and we hope to have another uh, another chat with you when you have it. Es un gran placer. Muchísimas uh -huh. gracias. <laughs>